NC of Salt Lake City meeting. We will begin our meeting this afternoon uh, with general comments to the board. And I have, um, if you would like to speak to the board, uh, giving us general comments, please fill out a card. I have one card from George Chapman. George, want to come up and uh, you know the drill, two minutes to address us on the topic of your choice. Okay, again, we've talked about this many times in the past. Just heads up, you have a uh, Operation Rio Grande. The third phase of it is supposed to be for work, but the weak link is you don't have any way for the homeless to get work. They need to store their stuff, but your storage facility is full. It's only eight to five, and they need a 24 hour, seven day a week storage facility that actually takes their stuff. Otherwise, why would they even try to work? So I'm asking you for RDA, figure a way to, you have to do it to make uh, the third phase work. So I, RDA has the money, needs to have the money put where you can have a 24 hour, seven day a week secure storage facility for otherwise homeless are not gonna even try to work. Does that make sense? You have the money, you have the uh, resources to do that. And you don't want them standing around on the sidewalk messing up the RDA territory when they should be working, right? So pour some money into Wigan Center or some facility down there that can take the 24 hour storage. I mean, Wigan Center is actually trying to expand to 7 p.m. And you should encourage that to get the people off the sidewalks. So that's what I'm asking you to do. And just a quick note, on the public safety building that you keep talking about in RDA, um, maybe you should just sell it and use that to buy cops. And finally, the Sears block. I haven't heard anything from RDA on Sears block, but that's what RDA should be doing. The city should be involved in working on the Sears block. It has the best potential for high density housing and mixed use, mixed income development. And that's a good start for the expansion area of uh, State Street. Thanks for listening. Chapman, and um, I, is there anyone else who would like to make a general comment to the board? Okay, not seeing anyone, then uh, we will move to item A2. The board accepting comments on uh, RDA budget amendment number two for fiscal year 2017-18 and I have a card from Nigel. I can't read your handwriting. If, when you come up, will you tell me? It starts with an S and I'm lost after that. Swaby, okay, thank you. Would you please speak to us uh, for two minutes? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nigel Swaby. I'm the chair of the River District Business Alliance. We are an organization on the west side of Salt Lake that represents dozens of businesses in the area. I'm here to speak to you about affordable housing and the long-term plans that are for the west side and the businesses that we represent. I want to speak in, in terms of outcomes instead of specific um, projects. One of the, and I also want to make sure you understand that we're not here to be against density. We understand that density in housing is going to happen and that's something that we're we're fine with so long as it's done in a way that creates ownership opportunities. Building just apartments in that area is not going to provide the best outcomes for the neighborhoods. There needs to be a balance and to provide ownership opportunities and ownership opportunities can meet uh, the affordable criteria. Uh, the second thing is that we would like to see uh, mixed use developments that have retail opportunities for the residents of the area. For instance, the overnighter property that you met on a few weeks ago was proposed to be solely uh, an apartment. And with what's going on with the development by the fairgrounds and the idea of putting a hotel in there and having lots of out of town visitors, it would make sense to have retail and restaurant opportunities in the area. So um, as you consider different different funding plans and different uh, strategies for affordable housing, I hope you take these into consideration. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for coming to speak to us. And George Chapman. Could have just had to stay at the table. Sorry, George. This is affordable housing then, right? Yes, sir. It's the but well, it's budget amendment number two that involves affordable housing. Right. Whatever, as long as yeah. you listen. Um, okay. The uh, affordable housing issue is really, really important. You're expanding State Street because of the housing potential. But if you take as long as you took with North Temple, um, it's going to take forever, and that's a shame. You do have the best chance for expanding affordable housing in Salt Lake City with State Street. That's the best chance. But it should have been done by now. And now we're being told it'll take until March to get it set up. That's way too long. So I'm encouraging you to do whatever you can. If you really care about affordable housing, you should be focused on State Street. State Street has the best potential. Put in a form-based zoning to encourage developers saying uh, mixed income, you'll get approved just like that. Wide sidewalks, just put in a form-based zoning to encourage the developers to build housing there. Mixed income, mixed use housing. And that's what we really, really need, affordable housing in a mixed-use, mixed-income neighborhood. State Street's the best potential. That's in your area, expansion area. And so I'm asking you to focus on that and speed it up because we can't wait another four or five years for this. But that's what it looks like it's going. So please speed it up. I know you, you care. Just faster. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chapman. We appreciate your comments. Now move to item B1 of the uh, agenda, which is approval of the minutes. And before I seek approval, I, I want to just um, ask a quick question. As I was reviewing the minutes, uh, there were some specific things that were asked. And I've got to scroll to the right place um, to have uh, some follow-up from the staff. and. Uh, those things were um, receiving from you the fair market value appraisal um, from the RDA staff on the overnighter. And, I, and I, I've seen it. I don't know if it was forwarded formally. So that and uh, you were going to come back with recommendations involving the costs um, of the proposed purchase of um, the overnighter and we've we've done that because we purchased it right so we're good with that and then any um, ways to mitigate the displacement of the current residents and I know you're proposing that and, and we're talking about that today in the funding are, are we good on that so um, board members were there any other changes or additions or comments on the minutes before I ask for approval okay then is there a motion to approve the minutes from October 24th 2017 Motion by Board Member Rogers, seconded by Board Member Luke. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you very much. We now move to item B2, the RDA Affordable Housing Funding Strategy. And at the table, we will have uh, Laura Fritz, Danny Walls, and Tammy Hunsaker. And as they make their way to the table, I'd like to thank the RDA staff and particularly Tammy for her work on um, this plan. It looks like Patrick is joining us as well, Patrick Leary, uh, Chief of Staff for the Mayor. And um, I, I want to underscore that this is um, a starting place for a conversation about affordable housing. And I appreciate that you, uh, we asked you to come back to us with ideas of how to spend the money that we've set aside for housing. And this is um, your first run at it. I don't think any of us expect this on either side to have this adopted as is. This is a great place to start the conversation. Some things may be adopted, some things may be changed completely, and I look forward to having a um, thorough and robust discussion about it. So with that, I'll... Madam Chair. Yes. I'm yes, ma'am. The, the hearings, uh, the recorder and Jennifer pointed out that they probably need to either be closed or continued. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then uh, I would look for a motion to either close or continue the he both hearings. Already <coughs> has Oh, thank you. And I just skipped right over that. Nope, I did not. Sorry, I blew that. <laughs> I so 
save those great thoughts I just said about all your good work. <laughs> and do we have anyone who wants to comment on the affordable housing funding strategy um, for the public hearing? We, we heard some comments on it. Okay, then I would look Madam for- Madam Chair? Yes. I move that we uh, continue the public hearing for the three, um, or the, continue the three public hearings to a later date. Second. Motion by board member Luke, seconded by board member Rogers. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that is unanimous. We don't need to do those separately, do we? I don't okay. think so. All right. Okay, thank you for catching that. That's why we have astute staff. All right, with that, we will um, turn it over to Danny. Do you want to start as Tammy? I, I, I will start, and I will just ask in the interest of time, Madam Chair, how much time would you like us to, to take on presenting and then opening it up to questions? Let's see. It's 20 to 3. Do you want to go till about 8 p.m.? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay, uh, let's, um, be, because we have two board members who have to catch planes, um, let's, let's try to do this in t 20 minutes, okay? And we'll we will come back to revisit it, but we, I think there's some other things on the agenda that our board members wanna discuss as well, so if we can um, do that, especially the bond discussion. So let's go ahead and see where we, how far we can get by three o'clock. Sure. Madam Chair, if I may start first, for, uh, and I'll be quick. Uh, the mayor, the executive director, wanted to make some comments that echoed, I think, your comments about this being an opening conversation about housing. Uh, we've asked staff, uh, both in the RDA and in hand, to bring forward a plan uh, to you, and I think uh, that uh, plan from hand will be before you, I hope, at the next council meeting. So we urge you to uh, embrace this as an opening conversation, two plans that will be presented to you uh, with the goal from us, uh, maybe a shared goal, to get these funds into use as quickly as possible, whatever whatever uh, decision either this board or the, the council adopts going forward. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and then I will just uh, continue with that dialogue in terms of the plan before you. Uh, as you indicated, Madam Chair, this, the idea behind this plan and bringing it before you was to start the conversation. It was the intention of the board when they set aside the 21 million that the administration and the council staff would work together on formulating a plan and then bringing it back for discussion and start having that conversation on the policy. Uh, as we set forth in this plan, you'll see within it that we laid out what we feel are the policy objectives that align what you have discussed as a council with the growing SLC plan as well as the overall RDA plan uh, objectives and requirements that we have. And so that was a very big component to us in terms of making sure that the use of these funds were being done in a way that, that aligned those objectives, carried out both the city's and the agency's goals for housing. We did that with a proposal of two different tactics, one of which is the acquisition and development and using funds for projects that are somewhat in the pipeline or being discussed and proposed right now. And at the time of the plan, we laid out five different projects that were in conversations between either the RDA or HAND or the Blue Ribbon Commission and providing funds that could go to those projects immediately and see those to fruition. And then the second tactic that you see uh, is described as a rent uh, incentive program and what that would be is a uh, program that was being proposed by staff as a way of putting funds out there in a flexible way to address projects that as they come online we could close the gap between the supply of units uh, as well as the the necessary units for affordability and either buy down the affordability within uh, affordable housing projects or incorporate affordable units within market rate developments and so it was a combination of of doing that in a way that we felt could be flexible, could be attractive to not only market rate developers, but affordable housing developers as well, in terms of changing the unit mix, uh, and doing so in a way that we would come back to you and actually formulate that program and continue that conversation into something that could be a program moving forward, but also still be flexible and adaptable to projects as they come online. So that is the basis for the plan. You'll see within the details, we tried to do that in a way that uh, prioritized leveraging of funds, to do it in a way that prioritized uh, use of the funds either within RDA project areas or within areas of high opportunity, but also provide the flexibility to do it in projects citywide and or with hand or other affordable housing developers. So that was the crux of it. Um, Tammy, what did I miss? Is there? 
you, I think something you, you would want to add. Okay. <laughs> um, and so with that, we'd be happy to discuss uh, any details of the plan, but it was really to kind of be where we're at today and start the conversation of what the policy goals and priorities would be. Great. I, I would like to make the request that I know you were given a lengthy list of questions that um, <laughs> we generated um, uh, at our end. And um, if we could ask you to um, respond to those questions. I know it kind of got derailed a little bit because we weren't sure what direction mm -hmm. things were going, but it would be helpful to have those answered. And we are looking to have an, an additional RDA meeting just because I can't have enough of these, <laughs> you know, or not, um, on the 28th of November. So if we could have um, responses for those questions and that, I know that's two weeks from today. Okay. So, but I hope maybe... Um, well, that got sidelined that you can do that, and I think that will be helpful for that conversation on the 28th. Sure. Thank you. And is there, let me look to our staff, when is a reasonable time for them? I know we'd like things two weeks in advance, but that's today. So I don't think that's probably going to happen. Um, what, a week, that's Thanksgiving. Okay. So, so if you can work to have those quickly. Thanks. Okay, um, board members, do you want to um, ask questions about anything specifically? All right, if, if no well, one. Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. Um, I d don't know if a question will come out of this, but I'd like to at least say a couple things on this plan. Uh, and just to echo uh, what Lisa mentioned a moment ago, I really appreciate the work that you put into this. Um, and thank you for working with the city council staff as well um, in formulating this plan. I think that it's uh, well thought out um, and it seems like you've anticipated our policy considerations quite a bit. Uh, so that's genuinely appreciated on our end. Um, and that's a beautiful proposal. So good job, Tammy, or whoever put this together. It's nice, it's easy to read, so that's always helpful. But. Um, and as much as this is a starting conversation for the, the $21 million, uh, I'd like to just acknowledge that we have already kind of executed on components of this plan uh, with the capital, the Overnighter Motel, excuse me, um, and the acquisition of that property a couple weeks ago. And so in some way, we've already bought into this plan as a board. And so that's one thing that I think we need to keep in mind as we move forward. And, you know, uh, as Patrick mentioned a moment ago, we will be, I guess, discussing um, a possible alternate proposal uh, next week when we are acting as a city council. Um, but, you know, for me, I think it's an incredibly important thing that we uh, tread lightly when we are using tax increment resources. Uh, this is generated uh, 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 after we've agreed to certain, um, um, we've have, we have deals with uh, our taxing partners and I wanna make sure that as we look toward spending uh, tax increment resources that we've accumulated over the years that uh, we do it with their consideration in mind as well. And so uh, I imagine that we will continue to have a dialogue around this and I can expand on that thought a little bit more fully if you'd like. but. Uh, I just want us to be mindful of RDA money being spent in um, RDA project areas and how we can uh, address our affordable housing priorities while also getting economic development and investment in neighborhoods that we have outlined through project areas that need to generate additional tax increment. So uh, let's just be mindful of how we spend tax increment dollars and that's my plea to this body. Board Member Luke. Uh, thank you, Board Chair, um, and, and thank you, Board Member uh, Kitchen. I, I completely agree. I think that um, this is a very exciting time uh, in Salt Lake City. I think it's an exciting time um, for you know, all entities in Salt Lake City, both the RDA and the, and the city administration and council. Um, we are, we've never seen the level of, of commitment to affordable housing uh, that we currently see from, uh, you know, across all um, city um, organizations. And so I want to thank the administration for, for that. I want to thank the RDA uh, for that. And I want to thank the council for that. Um, this is something, it, it, it truly 
is exciting. And I, I mentioned this um, when we, when we um, spoke about this in our last meeting. $21 million um, that, we've, that we've set aside is not a small amount of money, and it's something that I think we need to be very cautious about how we move forward with. Um, and I think it's important that we also look at the goals and objectives that this board um, had and the council uh, has had um, when, we, when we first set, the, set this aside. And that is to look at options for increasing affordability uh, citywide. Um, I think we do uh, have a number of um, requirements that we need to fill. I think we need to ensure that um, what we do, that we are judicious about how we do it, that we uh, carefully vet uh, each of these projects uh, that comes forward uh, to ensure that it is going to be successful, not just as a, uh, as a development, uh, a successful development opportunity, but successful for the individuals who are going to be living uh, in these uh, affordable uh, developments and for the surrounding neighbor neighborhoods as well. So we have three, those are really the three responsibilities that I think we have when looking at this money. Um, I think by and large the, uh, the plan uh, that we've seen um, is, is a good one. Um, I think that uh, there are you know, a lot of really good things. I, one of the things though that as a, as a board member, um, I think it's important for us to remember is that everyone is going to be watching these projects closely. Um, as we move forward. We need to ensure uh, that everything we do is as transparent as possible, uh, that we follow a process, uh, that it is an, an open process, uh, that we move as quickly as we possibly can, but we don't sacrifice transparency, we don't sacrifice uh, the potential success of these projects, and that we don't sacrifice um, the viability uh, for people to build themselves up um, in, the, in the name of speed. So, um, I do think though that, you know, when we look at the motion that this board made uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I know that there are some who felt that this may slow the process down. Uh, I disagree. I think that, um, you know, that, that we've, we've been very clear about what we want. We've been very clear about working with the RDA to ensure that um, that we do move forward in a, in a very quick way. Um, but we need to look at how these, each of these projects is going to be individual. There's not a, there's not a cookie cutter plan for any of these. And this plan, and, and the administration's plan, the RDA's plan that we're talking about, doesn't call for that, which is good. And so I think, you know, they're, we're, we're on a good path right now. Um, I think in order to ensure um, the transparency that is going to be as important as it is, to ensure that we have a number of, you know, that we have as many eyes on this as possible, um, I personally believe that we should not be uh, mass appropriating this $21 million to any specific entity. To, you know, whether it's to hand, whether it's to the RDA, I think that, um, it's important that we as a board have a direct role in each of these projects that is going to be using this money. And the reason for that is we will be accountable. We are accountable to our constituents. We're accountable to uh, the neighborhoods that, where these projects will be built. We are accountable to the individuals who will be living there. And we are accountable to those uh, tax increment partners. Um, in order for us to ensure um, that each of these projects fits with what we all believe, it's important that this board has a role. So I'm gonna be advocating that we do not um, mass appropriate this money, uh, that, we, that the money stay in the RDA, um, that whether it's HAND, whether it's the RDA, wh whichever organization uh, comes forward, that the proposals do come forward. Uh, I'm committed as a board member. I'm not, I'm not in leadership, board leadership, but I I'm, you know, believe that as a board, uh, we are as interested in moving forward as quickly as possible. Um, I don't see this as slowing down, but I do think that, um, that we, since we have set this money aside, um, it is a lot of money. And it is something that if one of these does not go well, it has the serious potential of hurting any other 
um, project that we move forward. And so I think having you know, the board as active and, and proactive in this process as possible uh, is going to be important. I think it will help ensure um, a successful project and, and it will also ensure that the administration, that the board, uh, and that the community are as close to being aligned uh, moving forward as possible. Since there are not, cook since no project is going to be a cookie cutter project, and that since this plan does not call for a cookie cutter uh, project that would be put down it, it, in, in certain places, it is important uh, that we address the individuality of each of these. We address the neighborhood needs uh, where these projects will go, uh, and that, that we do so um, in a judicious um, and an appropriate way. Thank you, Board Chair. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, it's really well done. Um, I have a question on page six, though, if you're there in the graphic. Uh, about tactic one, the affordable rent incentive program. Uh, just help me understand how you came up with your numbers uh, as far as um, targeting 200 affordable units, 50 at high opportunity, and 120 at 40% AMI and below. Give me a sense of where that came from. Uh, just looking at an average, so on page eight, mm -hmm. there's the um, maximum funding amounts per unit that we would anticipate. Yeah. So I just basically took the one bedroom average for RDA areas and calculated uh, the number of units that that would get. And then in the sources and uses, we have some of the funds set aside for high opportunity areas to fulfill that 4.5 requirement. So just calculated how many we could get off of that piece of funding. Okay. Uh, my, my second question is, is this um, an incentive that could be transferred and used within inclusionary zoning concepts? Po yeah, possibly. I mean, I think possibly it could because you, you would be reaching out to um, existing market rate developers throughout the prior city. To, prior to build, mm -hmm. not existing market rate um, buildings, prior to right? Building. Prior yes. to build, yeah. Yep. And so, so they would know going to, in this percentage I'd have for the subsidy to, to hit my target? Yes, you, you could tie it with a, a zoning requirement. How soon would this be available to go? I'm assuming sooner than the... Um, the intention would be to come back to the board and have a program approved, so as soon as we could come Do you have any ideas? Do you have anybody in mind right now, I guess? <laughs> no. Developments no, perhaps? We, we haven't reached out to anyone at this okay. point other than just start the conversation and see where that takes us. And then we would go out and want to, to discuss that with developers, with housing providers, and see how that could be structured, and then incorporate that if that was the direction with which we were given. It's my, my other question was, do you have a sense of who is building where right now? Because we have very specific geographic boundaries of uh, high opportunity areas, and do we know that there are um, projects going in that might be feasible for this kind of funding? Yeah, no, we haven't identified specific projects or areas yet as much as just the idea of... The idea? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. James? Yeah. Um, I'm, I guess I'm on that same page. It's number nine of our staff report. It's your projected outcomes page. And I'll just echo everyone else. This is a great, this is a well done uh, presentation, well put together. It's really easy to read. My question for you is in tactic number one, the eight, basically 8.5 million, how long is that going to last for? Depends on the market. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the demand in the market. It depends on what's built. But it, as you see in the plan, we, we've set it up to where if it's something that as we set up the program and it's successful, we would want to potentially continue to fund that on an ongoing annual basis. Yeah, so that's my point is that, you know, this is, this is, a, this is a program, right? You're programming this. Yeah. This is a, a voucher program, right? And basically, once it's there and you spend that money, it's gone. And you look at, for me, just looking at the, the bottom line, you, you have 8.5 million, you're going to get roughly 200 affordable units, right, that you don't, that aren't in per perpetuity. It's just there, right? But there would be a deed restriction on the unit. So right. it's not this, exactly the same as a, a voucher program in that it wouldn't be going to the tenant. It would be going to the project and the unit. For X amount of with years, a, right? Uh, yeah, we were anticipating either a 25 or a 50-year affordability, affordability period. So... Um, and we would be targeting new units um, right. because we've heard the board suggest that we want to add units to the housing stock to kind of alleviate some of the market demand and pressure that we have right now. So, so I guess my, my question is, with that 8.5 million, you're looking 25, 30 years for them to be bought down, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas basically for double the money, 
and total RDA funds expended, you're going to have 664 affordable units compared to 200. And, and that is leveraging other affordable units in the projects that we've identified. Um, so there are quite a few units going in, for example, the Barnes Bank project that right. Hand is leading. Um, so, yeah. The it's other function of that, too, is four and a half million of it is targeted towards the areas of opportunity. opportunity. And so right. in order to hit those areas of opportunity, you're looking at a higher subsidy amount because that gap is bigger. Yeah, so, I get it. I just yeah. think that if you're looking more bang for your buck in perpetuity or longer term, Tactic too. I mean, it just for me, it's just it's a no-brainer that you. I don't see why you wouldn't use that money and dump it in there to get some more affordable. You have control over in perpetuity. Right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the uh, part of the thought process was if the board and the administration wants to get these funds out in a quick manner, uh, kind of target some key projects to get those projects built. Um, I think if you target too many projects, they would be competing for the same tax credits or the same affordable housing resources. So looking at another way to leverage projects that are already in the pipeline and the private market's already doing um, on their own. So. I get it, but for me, I just look at it that we're, ha we're gonna be hands-on with all these projects, right? It's not like it's gonna be lighter, quicker, right. faster, cheaper, right? It's more, for me, it's we're, we're digging in our heels and we're gonna make sure that we have a serious impact with affordable housing in Salt Lake City. And for me, that is tactic two. Right, and I think what you're seeing, uh, Councilman, is that what we're trying to address are uh, a wide variety of area median incomes so that the affordable housing piece isn't all 80%, but there's a, there, in order to get some of those lower AMIs into our market, you have to fund at a higher level. Oh, I, I totally understand where you're coming from, Mayor, but 308 units that are 40% below, AMI or below compared to tactic number one where you have 120 at 40 percent of AMI below, 50 at a, at a high, high opportunity affordable units, and 63. I mean, you know, I'm just saying for me, moving forward, I, to me it's something that you can, you can control a lot easier. That's all I'm just trying to point out. And Council Member Rogers, part of um, what I challenged our team to look at is how could we quickly get units into the market, and more importantly, how can those units turn additional increment? And so if you're in an existing project, we're buying down units, we're still getting the tax increment on that full project. And so ultimately, this could be a program that could perpetuate based on the new tax increment that would be derived off that project. Mm -hmm. So that was part of what I challenged our team with. Okay. Derek? <clears throat> I, my question is not so much on the plan itself, but a specific uh, property. The Sugar House, uh, DI properties listed here on project number four. Mm -hmm. And it's just a simple update on the <laughs> timeline of the fire station. And when, if we could get uh, the administration to just let the board know where we're at and sure. when, because I'm not, I, I think it's been a while since we've been updated there. So I'd just like to, to know where that's at. Yeah, I think there needs to be some conversation about who ends up with the entire pie. Can you help me understand what you mean by that? Yeah, because these properties, part part of this is owned by the RDA and part of this is owned by the city. Sure. And I think we want to have discussion around who should have the entire pie because well, of it course we will should, better right? serve. Yes. <laughs> so that's where we're at. Okay. But as far as when the new fire station will open and then this one will be ready to go, and when, like, when do we need to have that conversation by? Do you have any idea on that? That is in June. I think that uh, is in June. Patrick, do you know? I my recollection is it's June. Oh, okay, it's in June. that helps me. Thank you. Other other questions, Erin? Yeah, thank you. My question was about a timeline. If you could give us a sense on the tactic two properties. Um, obviously, the overnighter. Yeah. We know. Um, <laughs> and and Wait, the, no, you're fine. just to point out, the Tactic 2 properties, um, we compiled those with projects that were kind of bubbling to the top at the time with the intent that each project would come back to the board when the details were fully fleshed out. So some of these projects uh, could change. Um, do you want me to speak to the ones I know about? Yeah, if you want to just run through um, and we can give a quick update. So in terms of the 500 West Permanent Supportive Housing Project, that project is currently applying for tax credits, 
and we'll know in a few weeks if that project was awarded the tax credits. Even if they get tax credits, I've uh, spoken with the developer, and it is permanent supportive housing, so yeah. serving a very low AMI, so it is anticipated that they still will need um, additional housing resources from the city. So we'll know more after, we'll have a better idea of the full uh, capital stack needs once those tax credit awards are announced. Um, as far as the Barnes Bank property, the exchange, um, the developer is actually waiting to hear if they are receiving HUD 220-D4, a HUD program financing through them. But through their, uh, the proposal they submitted through the RFP process that HAND ran, um, they did anticipate coming to the city, uh, either the Housing Trust Fund or the RDA for a loan on that project. And that's where the, these numbers came from. So we're anticipating that that would still move forward. Um, I think I have, I noted a timeline in there. I think they're not planning on breaking ground until December of 2018 on that project. And then Sugar House, um, as the mayor just spoke to, we, we need to figure out kind of the acquisition of those properties. Um, the Capital Motel, I don't know. Capital Motel, my understanding is uh, the deadline is through the end of the month. Danny, will heard? you pull that mic? Oh, sorry. The mic. Uh, deadline is through the end of the month, and it's my understanding the Housing Authority is currently working on that to see if, uh, if they can put the capital stack in place to purchase that. Uh, the Overnighter, we are the proud owners of, and so we closed on that uh, a week ago Friday. 255 South State, we have a written briefing in your packet uh, basically stating that we plan on putting that out on the market after the first of the year. And I think that's all of them. Thank you. My, um, my other question is around the uh, uh, tactic one and whether or not there are already existing programs in hand that do similar, similar to what is being proposed here. I know Han's not at the table, and I don't see Melissa in the house. Melissa's, she's not here. I believe they do have a program run through the Community Foundation that offers, I believe it was set up to offer an incentive up to 50,000 per unit, but um, Han definitely would have more information on that program. I would like to hear more about that because my recollection on that piece of funding or the, the program it's, as it's currently administered is that it's not highly utilized. And I would like to understand why, first of all, we would want a new program sort of reinventing the wheel and what that then would accomplish that we couldn't accomplish through the existing program. And also why, um, if my understanding is correct, that it's not that utilized, because this is a significant amount of money we would be committing to and I'm sure there's lots of streams of incentives that um, I'd like to learn about that may or may not be happening through the existing program. So this is the piece of money that in looking at what's already on the ground and what the perhaps hand should administer, that's why I, I, I need to know more about what they are currently doing and how utilized it is and where they see opportunities for growth. Because frankly, this feels like a lot of money to compared to what we're currently seeing the need for yeah. through and that that's, program. That was our intention with that incentive program was to reach out to the developers and and the market and see to the extent of how we could structure it. If there was a way that it could be structured different, if if the program that hand funded, if that's um, something that we need to tweak or, or do differently, that's how we would we would look at it and come back and try to figure out if there was a different way we could be doing it, if there was a different structure to that incentive, or whether it was just a matter of getting out there and really getting in touch with the developers on how to make that work within their specific projects. And maybe that just needs to be a little more flexible in how we do that. So the idea with creating that program was that we would go out and basically try to get that information that you're asking for and see if, if it is possible to structure it in a way, or if there's some other program that we need to be looking at. Maybe there's something else we discover that, that there is a gap. So did, do you, did you contemplate that perhaps um, if we get to a point where inclusionary zoning discussion uh, is successful in mm -hmm. getting some sort of implementation there, that they, these monies could apply to inclusionary um, incentive opportunities for developers? 
I'm seeing nods. I don't think we got to the point where we directly tied them together, but right. we definitely saw that those could be two two avenues that the city would use and that this could be a way that if you did inclusionary zoning, that this could be a resource that could be provided and to make could, that happen. Uh, I'm also concerned about demolition, um, and I know that we have a demolition ordinance that we're looking at, but looking a little bit more acutely at the elimination of existing affordable housing for the creation of new housing, whether it's affordable or not. Um, I think that we have a lot of growth that we can do. I, I actually like, I think that we, we negotiate our values um, to James's point about, you know, you get a lot more bang out of your buck if we're just building projects and we can lock things into per perpetuity a little easier. Mm -hmm. That's definitely true, but I do think the value is important that we have a diverse housing mix, that we aren't just building all new affordable housing, but that we're preserving existing affordable housing. And where we can't preserve it, where demolition is going to happen, I think that I would look to this, these monies to help us figure out ways to ensure recover continuation yeah. of existing. Mm -hmm. We'd want to recover those. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's all of my questions. I, I agree with, with Board Member Kitchen. This is a really well done proposal. Yes. Um, and I would like, it's been a lot of fun finding this $21 million. And now it's a lot of fun looking at how to spend this money. So maybe we could come up with another twenty million or so. Uh, and we'll just keep it going. <laughs> any, well, any further? Go, go ahead, Mayor. <laughs> There's not a ton of money to make in affordable housing. So just so you yeah. know that. Um, I do want to make a statement, though. Um, so last year when the board decided to reprioritize the $21 million um, to put toward affordable housing, a board member said that the point is not to make a little dip, but a huge splash. And during that conversation, you also focused on the sense of urgency this body felt correctly connecting our city's housing crisis with homelessness and the building of new resource centers. One board member stated this well in saying to a reporter afterward, we wanted to make a statement that we're ready to do something major for housing because we see homelessness and housing as parallel tracks. And they are parallel. Shelter the homeless is on track to close the road home downtown shelter and replace it with new resource centers, two of which will be in Salt Lake. The decision to close the shelter was made by the state legislature, and one which I strongly believe state leaders and Shelter the Homeless fully intend to keep. So there was some dialogue around that at the last meeting, and I wanted to share that. And according to state statute, um, the closure is designated for June of 2019. So while the new resource centers will be spaces of hope and opportunity for many, they will only be maximized if paired with options for deeply affordable housing. The new model is based on moving people from homelessness into housing within 60 to 90 days. And if we fail to create our huge splash in housing stock opportunities before June of 2019, we will begin to see the new model at a very significant disadvantage for our city. This city and our entire region are in the midst of an affordable housing crisis. The crisis touches people at many levels of income from those working to leave homelessness to double wage earning families. To solve the crisis, we must be innovative in our thinking and expedite our processes. To meet these goals, my administration has over the past weeks developed and presented two innovative paths for the funding you have prioritized. A critical component of this plan is working more closely with nonprofits and developers which have been going through the Blue Ribbon Commission work. In order to make this plan work, I invite the RDA board to work with my staff to maximize opportunities, to work through 
processes so we can accept generous support from industry experts and nonprofits who have committed to help us address this crisis and meet that deadline. The other plan which we transmitted to the council involves transferring the funding to the resident guided housing trust fund. This will make dollars immediately available for housing projects while utilizing a process familiar to the council and with in public input. Both processes provide the transparency you are looking for and it is my hope that prior to deciding that you will take a fair look at both processes and then determine the direction you would like to head. Either direction, we are committed to working with you. We want to thank this board and this council for carefully considering both plans while also committing to act before the end of this year, which is a timely piece for us in trying to get projects off the ground by June of 2018. Off the ground and completed. By June of 2018? 2019, sorry. Whoa, I was sorry. gonna say. There you go. Okay. Um, so, but thank you. Be, before I respond to that, I sure. had one comment on the plan that I was waiting for everybody to have the chance to speak. Um, one concern I have is how little of the plan includes areas of opportunity and that, that they're only in the whole table, there are only two things that talk about area of opportunity. I know it's really difficult, but I think um, we have over and over again talked about um, how important that is as a value to this board and um, to the council. So I think we need to look for ways to expand that. Um, then in response, Mayor, to your statement, um, we are eager to move forward. I think the board wants to I kind of feel like we're being presented with two contradictory plans and we're willing to take a look at them and, and consider them, but they seem to go different ways. Um, today isn't the time to have the discussion about the plan that we're going to look at as far as turning the housing trust fund over um, the RDA money to the housing trust fund. We'll save that conversation for another day. But um, I also think it's important to say that um, in conversations with the Blue Ribbon Commission, over and over again, it's been acknowledged there's pretty much no way to have a thousand units ready in June of, of 2019. Yeah, so um, the, we had a window there. Um, the direction that was taken on the overnighter took um, uh, about 350 units out of our reach within June of 2019. So yes, how do you you're right. That? I'm, I'm not clear on how that's the case. Well, we lost the developer who was willing to do that project at cost for us. And um, but there'd been no RFP. They didn't give us right. any of the answers to any of our questions, and yeah. we were going to ghettoize that area. So that's why I'm inviting you all to work with the Blue Ribbon Commission so that you can have these conversations directly with um, community leaders who are really trying to be helpful. So, Well, and I, I think we agree with that. I don't think we slowed anything down because they were hoping to get financing from the feds and that was going to take a year. So they were they would not they had in their contract a whole year to get their financing. So a year from now and we set aside this money a year ago and we just got this housing plan five weeks ago that, that yeah, from so, the RDA. Yeah. So we, we've been waiting on you all and you did it uh, and we like what we have, right. but we also feel like it's a little bit of a false deadline. Yes, the ordinance from the state says they've got to close the road home, but I haven't heard from the state that they're saying we we've got to have a thousand units. I don't know where that's coming from. No, I, the thousand units was really a goal based on numbers that we are seeing at the shelters. Right. And trying to make sure that um, we as a community don't get caught um, with people on our streets and nowhere to go. So the thousand units was really created in a way to create that safety net um, and the members of the Blue Ribbon Commission really came together in good faith to help our city maximize the, the $21 million. And um, so 
there's no finger pointing going on uh, here. What I'm trying to say is please come to those meetings and have your conversations with the members of the Blue Ribbon Commission who really truly are trying to do the right thing and help us. Well, I would agree with that, and I've met with them twice uh, with the leadership and appreciate that. Are, are they going to continue to exist? Yes. Because mm -hmm. I, yes. I wasn't sure, because I know two weeks ago, three weeks ago, there was a meeting that was called for, and then it was canceled, and then we later heard some members of that commission met with you, but James Rogers was not included in that meeting. Maybe it was only oh, the leadership. Oh, it was just the co-chairs. Okay. Yeah. And, and so we didn't know if that was to make a decision, if it was going to continue to exist or what that was. But before we did anything with the overnighter, they said, you can't build a thousand units. And they said that and in my meeting with them, I stressed it was really important to us that we had a mix of affordable and that we were not doing um, particularly on um, North Temple a project that was deeply affordable with no market rate. Yeah, and they nobody wants and that project. That. So Yeah, in yeah. fact, we don't want any of the projects that we do, at least the administration, to be the projects. Uh, we are really looking for mixed income. We know that that model works better in all parts of our city. Right. Um, and so that's kind of what the goal is, whether the money is with RDA or with hand. Great, thank you. All right, we will wrap this up because we're now 22 minutes past when I said we would stop that discussion, uh, but we'll come back to it. So thank you very much. It's a good start for the conversation. Again, Tammy, thank you for your hard work on this plan. We appreciate it. And we will now move to um, our, we're gonna jump down to uh, number, I believe it is six on our agenda to um, talk about financing options. Um, from, and we're going to have an update from the RDA financial advisor, and that would be um, our friends from George K. Baum. Come on up. Looks like John Crandall. And Elizabeth Reed, right? Yes. Okay, thanks. And uh, for those who don't know, these are our, the city's advisors when it comes to financing and bonding. So they have taken a look at RDA and are gonna go over what some of our options are. And while we still have Derek with us. Perfect. Right, thank you. Great. Um, so we were asked, well, good afternoon. Um, we were asked to review a memo we prepared um, back in September. And as you recall, we were here in March discussing some financing options and some of the things that have changed since March were we were given updated revenue figures as well as fund balances for the tax increment in the different project areas. And we were provided that on, on September 18th from city staff. We were also given an updated list of projects which was a little bit more than what we had back in the beginning of the year. Um, we are asked to uh, calculate the debt capacity of each project area based on this, uh, based on the revenues, and so we we have prepared in the memo a summary of the re revenues we were given, and then we looked at the sunset of each of those revenues and have provided a maximum bond amount for each project area. And so this does include, I just wanted to point out that this does include CBD, but, it, but there are no projects in the CBD that are identified on page one of the memo. John, please step in. If if you okay. think I've missed anything. Um, and, then, and then we included another table that looks at both the maximum bond amount and the, to the fiscal year 2018 fund balance that's available. And that is our estimated project amount. And this is all based on issuing um, 
tax increment revenue bonds through the RDA. We also, the, there's another source available, and that's the Program Income Fund. And we looked at the debt capacity for uh, that, the PIF, and we concluded that the maximum amount of uh, a bond transaction would be, or that with using the tax increment is 9.7 million, and then with the 7.3 million in cash balance, um, th there would be 17 million available. Lisa and Council, do you you all kind of understand the the siloing of these project areas and right. revenues and project expenses have to kind of stay within those project areas. Right, okay. right. That's kind of one of the parameters that we're working with. Right, they need to do that. So um, would it be uh, fair to say that um, because project income fund is the most flexible money we have, is that a good use of that money? because it ties it up and we can't, can't do, do anything else. I mean, from a financial point of view, does that make sense to take our most flexible dollars for that? It is an interesting question. We are, the way we approach this, and I think that you're spot on with regard to that question, with regard to flexibility. It's like your home equity loan. It's no questions asked. You can write your check on that. Uh, but we had a task of trying to fulfill the project list. So, you know, we had $40 million that we're trying to figure out with your available funds that you have between the various RDA projects that match up with the revenues and other available funds, how could we fund that $40 million? So uh, the PIF could or could not be used, but we're, if we don't use it, then we'll fall even further short of that $40 million. Right. And just to mention that this, this, this would take the PIF a revenue for 20 years. This is an estimated 20 year transaction. So Commitment. yeah, you would use okay. all of the PIF for 20 years. So these are just capacities. Right. Okay. Okay. Th thanks for letting me interrupt. Um, do you, have, do you, do you want to go on or? Yeah, I was just going to mention, so if, the last. Let me just have you hit pause for just a second. Okay. Are there questions around that? That was, minute? is that assuming static PIF revenue? Is that? I'm sorry. The 20-year commitment, is it static PIF revenue? Yes, after, uh, I believe the revenues went out to 2027, and then it was static after that. Okay, they thank grow. you. They grow. They are growing up till to 2027. And then just assuming flat revenues right. at that point. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we looked at an option um, to... Um, issue the sales tax bonds using those same same revenues and this you know as we've we've discussed before this uh, sales tax bonds the it's the interest cost is typically less cuz it's a higher rated transaction so it's a lower cost of interest and you don't have the um, restrictions of an RDA indenture uh, with an additional bonds test. So you can use, you know, one, one times coverage, whereas with, with a tax increment, it has to be 1.25 times. So you have more revenue available to pay on a sales tax bond. So we looked at um, a sales tax bond funding all 40 million pro in projects, and we found that the, the revenue identified um, being the, the TIF for each project area and the fund balances, it would uh, fall short um, by approximately a half a million to a million in years 19 through 28 and, and close to a million um, in the years after that, for the next, for the years um, following that through 2038, and um, but we did look at what what the city could issue, and that's approximately 28 million worth of projects, and and the PIF could be used 
for any of the projects, so we didn't identify which project that would be used for, but just that it's available to be used in the different project areas. And there is supplemental information in the, in the back that kind of illustrates in more detail um, what the, the funds that are available and the, and the shortfalls. Uh, Elizabeth, can I just yeah. add that we provided on page five the bonding capacity as we analyzed with regard to sales tax revenue bonds, so your ability to pay back sales tax revenues. And the reason why, as Elizabeth said, sales tax is it's because it's the easiest and the lowest cost that would work with this. If we used RDA tax increment bonds and issued under that indenture, you have stiffer additional bonds tests and you'll be able to issue less, meaning you'll be able to raise less for your project. So the sales tax bonds revenue on page five, this bonding capacity is based on sales tax because that does provide the greatest amount of available funds. But you can see that we're still short uh, versus the 40 million that was the project list. Now I would like to say that this is uh, information that was provided to us if there's new information or if we're missing information or our fund balances are dated, then obviously that would change uh, the outcome. But part of the concern is when you have on page two, you have your budget projections and you can see that your sunset of revenues occur, you know, all within the next five years on those project areas and that's a, that ties your hands as far as what revenue is available. There are options to maybe extend that. I'm not sure the RDA would have to, uh, the staff would have to look at that. But when you have, uh, you know, West Temple Gateway maturing in 2019, then uh, they're not gonna be able to pay much. And one of their project areas is $3 million. But their, their uh, budget sunsets in 2019 so there's just not going to be enough time to pay that three million dollars so that's where the PIF comes in hand to try to help fund right. those areas that don't have the revenues cindy guest jensen just a quick um note to to add on to what um the chair is saying in that a few minutes ago and that is that the first round of this, um, the numbers that they were dealing with were quite constrained. So this round, what we asked them to do is to tell us just the maximum. Mm -hmm. So the maximum we, we aren't suggesting as staff is at all practical. And we know that you're not suggesting that either. So what, what we're trying to do is give you the idea of the range and the wiggle room. So um, you would want to do a lot more discussing of this, um, but we wanted to get you just the basic information. So uh, you might want to totally rethink the projects. You might want to um, look at what level of flexibility you would want. You might decide that you don't ever want to include any PIF, um, all those sorts of things. So this is uh, giving you a look at the maximum capacity so that just to inform your conversations. Got it. Any, any further questions? Do you have more you want to add? Okay, for, further questions? Anybody? Okay, that gives us a good sense of where to start. Oh, maybe Mary Beth has something to add. What, what stipulations? What are you referring to? The uh, Mary Beth correctly was reminding us that there will be uh, some titling concerns or questions with regard to sales tax. And so part of the uh, discussion, will, if you decide to use sales tax revenues as a pledge or security for bonds, there might need to be uh, some sort of a loan agreement or something with the RDA so the RDA can do some of these improvements so we can avoid some ownership issues with regard to the projects. But Mary Beth, uh, do you want to add to that? 
So the other thing I wanted to note is that um, if you bond for RDA, sorry about my it's voice. It's okay. If you bond with RDA, we don't have to own those assets, right? If you use a sales tax bond, we have the city has to own those assets. So those are two significant distinctions that we need to be made aware of as we go forward in the bonding discussions. Thank you for flagging that for us. And we have managed that successfully in the past. It's, it's something that needs to be done, but we know how to do it. Right, right? correct. Well, you know what, Mary Beth, I think this is directly relating to that. It wasn't John, can you speak right into the it's, mic? It's the underground. It's the underland the underground fabling yeah. that was going to be owned by someone else. I think that, I'm sorry I didn't pick up on that initially. Right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mary Beth. Get feeling better. All right, we will go back in our agenda. Thank you very much, John and Elizabeth, for being here with us. And we will um, go back to... Um, to make sure we're in the right spot which one the budget but that's what i was thinking but um b3 the budget amendment number two for this year um lara do you want to join us and jennifer ben and is danny going to join you as well and we'll talk through this Whatever. <laughs> for a second i was just trying to see if i'd flip back to the general comments instead of there hoping you kind would, of a wouldn't things. notice and I could just let Jennifer do it. <laughs> <laughs> Either way. So this is a technically budget amendment number two for the RDA this year, because uh, if you'll remember, the overnighter was actually budget amendment number one, but this is probably the first regularly uh, processed budget amendment. Um, this is the RDA piece of the Operation Rio Grande funding. That's item A1. So uh, the overall discussion of Operation Rio Grande funding was discussed in the um, context of the council. This is the piece that would essentially uh, free up the RDA funds to be paid to the city. Um, and the uses are, uh, as listed on the chart on the staff report, treatment beds, the House 20 Rental Assistance Program, and the parking lot retrofit on 5th West. So if there's questions on that. I'll move on to the next one. Board members, do we have questions on this um, budget amendment? Seriously? Well, I, I guess I have one in regards uh -huh. to okay. budget amendment, and that's in, in regards to the, if I'm on the right place, the treatment beds for Operation Rio Grande. The 685,000, I guess we're gonna have 1,025,000 transferring, right? Total, yeah. Total. and. I mean, how long is that money going to last? How long until, I mean, is that's not sustainable. Are we going to have to come back again and have a conversation about the next funding round or? Right. The, the way that the administration has uh, described the treatment beds in the past is that it's a two year need. And I, David, he's much more articulate at this because he's answered the same question 500 times again. from me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, board member, uh, for the question. Um, so the $685,000, if you recall, was a um, uh, commitment we made during the legislative session when we were still kind of talking about operation diversion. Um, we were asked <coughs> by the legislature at the time for um, two-year commitment to uh, on the $685,000. And so we anticipate in the mayor's budget proposing the $685,000 again next year for the treatment. The, Funding itself is anticipated for um, one year worth of treatment. It is a partnership um, in the interlocal with Salt Lake County Behavioral Health Services that allows our community connection center staff to directly refer individuals to treatment. And so while you have through Operation Rio Grande kind of a a kind of a, a criminal justice diversion component where individuals are arrested then are assessed through the jail and then can go through a new drug court program. The $685,000 this year and what we would anticipate uh, next year is more on a voluntary basis where through engagement with our social workers, um, they uh, have access to treatment beds through the Salt Lake County uh, Behavioral Health Network. And so that funding itself is, is, is a one, one year's worth of funding. And, and, and as we've said before, that that's a non-traditional, um, uh, that's not a service that the city traditionally funds, and our commitment is only for those two years. We, don't, we do not anticipate that, that we, as the city, would take that on as a, uh, as a regular thing. So next year, the mayor's budget will show that allocation in their, in their proposal. Okay. 
Uh, I had another question as well, and that is in regards to the metrics and, and measuring out how Operation Rio Grande is being effective. I, I've heard data scattered from you know, all different realms, right? So I'm wondering if we have any solid data that can be trend, you know, handed out. Not solid data yet. Okay. Um, as, as we've discussed uh, before uh, in terms of, of the safe space and Operation Rio Grande overall, I think the, the overall overarching outcomes that we're looking at and we'll be tracking data around besides things like public safety, uh, but connecting individuals to housing um, uh, as a key measure of reducing homelessness, which is one of the, which is a primary goal of Operation Rio Grande as well as, um, as, well as the public safety component. You know, it's, it's such an important factor for all of us in the city that even if you have small little wins and little data points, please send them on to us so that we can Absolutely. in turn share that with the neighborhoods and our residents. I, I want to just follow up on James. Um, in terms of Operation Rio Grande, I know that's ongoing, but Operation Diversion was a year ago, and just because Andrew Johnston can't be here and he loves to know about metrics, I need to ask that, that do we have <coughs> metrics for Operation Diversion of how we've done with people staying in treatment, and, and can we get those sure. from you? And yeah. I, you know, and I, I, when we were talking about it six months ago, um, and we had some people criticize how few people had had success in, in receiving treatment. I was making a pretty big deal out of, but if you're the one person that was successful, it's important to you and your family, and it's important to the community. It's a very expensive way to get one person help, but I, I think we've also seen that um, people seem to have the most success who go into our community connection center and say, hey, can you get me help? rather than being rounded up and saying, your choice is jail or help. Is right. it, would you say that, that that's my impression? Yeah, and, and the Community Connection Center has that data. I will say, and, and I appreciate the opportunity because I did not get the opportunity to respond to this when this was brought up in the past. Um, <coughs> Operation Diversion um, incorporated both a criminal justice diversion and the voluntary. Right. And while, and, and we'll look, and we'll, we'll report back on the data, while the retention rate was lower on the criminal justice side. I, I mean, don't quote me, but I, I remember at a time like 18% or so in terms of retention and treatment, and we were uh, over double that with the voluntary um, so that we did have success through Operation Diversion. A lot of that came through the engagement, and, but some of those that were engaged were individuals that were initially um, in treatment through criminal justice diversion, left, and then we re-engaged with the Community Connection Center. And the other thing I, but the, one thing I would say that even with the criminal justice diversion being lower than at the voluntary, we were still seeing at one point, it was higher than retention normally is within behavioral health treatment. So I think we all acknowledge that um, for individuals with a severe addiction, the population that we're working with um, leaving treatment and re-engaging is, is a path, is a part of the path of treatment. And so I appreciate you recognizing even with that one life, um, but I, we will get that day and I do believe we're having more success than was really being recognized. That, that, that's great. And I know statistically they say it takes people four to five times usually through a treatment process in order to get there. Madam did, Board Chair. Yeah, Aaron, did you have a further question? Aaron and then Charlie. Yep. Is that okay. But if if yours is about uh, Operation Rio Grande, mine is not. Okay. Yeah. It it, it is um, a little bit about this. Um, we've had we've had discussions not as an RDA board but as a council um, about the uh, you know delineating the responsibilities of Operation Rio Grande, and I think if you could just um, clarify because I know that with um, Operation Diversion. Uh, we funded uh, treatment beds, which because we didn't really have a state partner at the time, um, and I know that we've talked about you know the importance of uh, having the city take on specific municipal responsibilities related to Operation Rio Grande um, treatment um, and, and provide, providing treatment beds you know in the in the broader scope is not necessarily a part. Um, can you just um, let us know how the six hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars? Um, why that's different from from what we've talked about um, in the past, so that you know we're why we would fund this and we wouldn't fund you know jail beds or we wouldn't fund um, some of the other treatment beds and, and instead focus on law enforcement capacity. Yeah, absolutely. I'll do my best. I, w I would say, count, uh, board member, that um, it really generated out of what we did do 
uh, initially with Operation Diversion, where um, the ca the city participated with the county in funding uh, some of the treatment associated with Operation Diversion initially. And during the legislative session, when we were seeking funding, uh, city and county together seeking uh, support to continue Operation Diversion was where um, uh, by the state as a part of um, seeking that funding, we were uh, asked to um, uh, participate by contributing additional funding to um, to the treatment. Uh, and so that's where recognizing that it's, it's outside our normal operations in and in a city service at the time during the legislative session, looking at that opportunity to continue with Operation Diversion and knowing that um, really the majority if not almost all of the costs associated with operation diversion was really treatment uh, that's where the funding was needed and so we were asked to make that commitment and, and we did and and of course we never said I mean, our, our commitment was we would put it forward in sure. the mayor's budget now thank you thank you for the clarification i'm supportive um of of this but i do think it's a slippery slope that we need to be careful about um, so that if, you know, on these, uh, you know, on future partnerships, whether it's Operation Rio Grande or other partnerships with the county and the state, that we don't get roped into uh, funding things that are outside of the bailiwick of, of municipal government um, and instead, you know, work within that partnership to explain we will fund everything that is within our purview. Um, we're going to have to put a lot of money towards law enforcement, which is what we talked about in the previous council meeting. Uh, so um, just please keep that in mind. And, and, and I request that you know we as board members do as well because uh, this is outside of the normal operations of of municipal government I, yeah I, I, thank you board member we absolutely always keep that in mind and definitely will and um i i would only add that i think um we all um uh, recognize both from the administration and the council and rda by the amount of the, the the great support that we've received from all of you that we were really um uh, uh in you know desperate to make a difference de desperate to make an impact and so we stretch that line a little bit but we will we will be cognizant of it i will say that the medicaid expansion uh that was recently approved and just yesterday the final step of approval occurred um uh, will hopefully um reduce the need uh for even that conversation in the future thanks um speaking of what is it within the purview and not within the purview, I want to talk about the board added item. Um, and just check in if you had a chance regarding the previous uh, request that was in this budget amendment on uh, downtown placemaking, whether or not you've had an opportunity to engage with the cultural core folks at the county about how the RDA can achieve some of the goals that you're seeking to achieve with that budget request with the half a million that we've already allocated to that project <laughs> I, I was assuming Laura was going to delegate this to me so um, to answer your question we did not reach out directly to the excellence in the community folks uh, we have no, no I'm asking about the cultural core first oh okay so I did have lunch with um, the recent awardees of the contract which is the downtown Alliance to talk about um, their goals and objectives, how um, the RDA can help support that. We have lots of ideas, um, but the implementation plan is going to take a little bit longer. Okay. I, if you could keep us updated on how that is working or if there's gaps in what you had hoped to accomplish with the request and what will be executed with that, that um, contract that it would be good to to know so yes getting to excellence in the community okay so you were going now. somewhere with that why don't you just <laughs> keep going and um, I was gonna go somewhere uh, we did not reach out to them instead what we did is we reached out to Talitha the director at the Gallivan Center um, and we indicated to her our concerns with um, funding that under the the legal opinion that we have from the city attorney's office and what we have proposed to look at is running the excellence in the community contract through Gallivan and their programming efforts and so that it is under the umbrella of how Gallivan should operate in terms of programming events and doing fundraising and trying to offset those costs their traditional way and then to the extent that the board would like to support funding that contract through Gallivan if there is a shortage in those funds then the board could do that as part of what is our annual allocation for programming of Gallivan and so the argument there is 
We have a very well established precedent with our programming contract with Gallivan because we're part of an owners association in Gucoa, whereas the contract with excellence in the community is one that was an annual contract that had happened to be renewed on a regular basis before it was ceased. Um, but I think legally we would be better funding that through our relationship with Gallivan directly and have them run it as a program. Okay, that sounds a little different than the way that I read the staff report around using the funding potentially to author a strategic plan in a long term. So, that sounds yes, more so like I'll a let planning Laura speak document to that because there's been somewhat of a change a in that through. direction. Small yeah. change. <laughs> um, so we still would like to come up with a strategy for the arts and culture and tourism in Salt Lake City. Um, there are a number of different buckets by which funding for the arts is currently handled. Mm -hmm. And we'd really like to come up with a better strategy and policies around how we fund the arts and making sure that it's meaningful to our artistic community. That being said, we've did a little research and realized that there are no less than four pages of studies that have already been done in the arts. So what we're doing now is we're collecting all of those. We're going to utilize some of our salary savings to engage someone to help us weed through all of those studies that have already been completed and identify those key areas that we can start to develop a strategy around. So I think we'll be coming back to you uh, for a request on how to fund wrapping all that together. But we wanted to do a deep data dive and understand what data we have today and understand what data we still need to find. I appreciate someone taking the time to consolidate the relevant data as it applies to the arts in the community conversation and our funding and creating a strategy and potentially policy around that. But that does feel like a separate discussion from the one at hand, mm -hmm. not hand, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying, that we have an existing proven engagement happening with between the community and arts and a very specific piece of the community um, an, an elderly piece of the community to some extent that engages with music year-round, hundreds of concerts, literally. Um, and I guess I, I could see where a strategy could take us away from funding, potentially take us away from funding something like ex excellence in the community, but for now that is a program that is very well run and has been well run for a long time at the Gallivan Center. And so I'm, I want us to, I appreciate that you're looking at the long-term strategic approach of funding for the arts from the city. Please do. <laughs> but for now, I want to ensure that this programming is able to continue. And board member Mendenhall, that's why Danny um, has come up with this really creative solution, which is to include it as part of our Gallivan maintenance contract, um, where you know we contract with the public services to maintain and um, handle Gallivan's events and the like. So adding it to that, because the concern that I have as a director is the precedent we set by funding one-off programming. Because if we do that, could we fund Twilight? Could we fund another program? And so for my concern is, where does it stop? And so including it as part of an existing contract, that makes a little bit more sense to me. And is that something that we should include then in today's budget amendment? I would think to the extent that you wanted to secure funding in the event that Gallivan ran in the red in their programming, you could certainly do that. Or you could wait till we come back and right. propose it at that time. And I would let Jennifer speak to that if she has I, I mean, I think either approach is fine. And I think if you appropriate it as part of this budget amendment and it's not fully used, like maybe, you know, they don't need the full amount, then that those funds could certainly be recaptured at the end of the year. You could ask for a report from the Gallivan staff about what the actual need is in terms of their ongoing budget. Um, but those are some of the things you could do. I, I would like to take that approach, the latter approach and add that to today's budget amendment considerations. And if you all want to talk about this, I, I would love to talk about this right now. I don't want to create discontinuity in the programming itself. Um, and I know from so many discussions we've had, different organization with Twilight, how um, the programming is 
front loaded, very much so, and budget dependent, of course. So I don't want to push it off too far so that we have them be forced to shut down. And just to be clear, the board's not acting on this budget amendment today. The action would likely come on December 5th. December, so but we're staff set will up. work yeah. with um, staff to um, get the wording right so that we are clear that it's for excellence in the community and that we want Gallivan to report back on what their needs are. And I really do understand, and actually if you come to some conclusion that the specificity of the organization itself needs to be left out so that Gallivan could potentially contract with some other organization to achieve that programming, I would be open to hearing about that strategy and the language in there. I, I think I can speak for the board on this that um, as we've discussed excellence in the community specifically, I think we're all very interested in making sure RDA properties are programmed and this is one that has has had great success and it, and I agree with Aaron I I want to see us find a way to make sure it happens I think you've come up with a creative solution to that I also agree Lara that we don't want to just have it be one off all the time that it makes a lot of sense to try to have it be um, this way um, Charlie did you ha have anything James okay then I want to um, ask that if you could uh, track and report the actual costs on the overnighter so that for future <laughs> motel purchases, because we may do that, acquisitions, whatever, we'll have a pretty clear picture of what the property holding expenses are month by month, as well as included in that, um, what it's costing us to find new places for um, the folks who've been long term there. And that that would be really helpful. Okay, any, anything further on the budget amendment? Then we will um, look for those changes. And um, we continued the hearing. So we will discuss it further and um, look for action on December 5th. Mm -hmm. And um, procedurally, uh, just to remind the board, there's a step that you actually, you need to vote to close the public hearing before you adopt any of the budget amendment things. And so the motion sheet for December 5th will, will reference the public hearing. So just so that you're not surprised. Closing the public hearing. Close the public hearing at that, hearing point. At that yeah. point. Yeah. Okay. Very good. All right. Thank you very much. We now move to item um, B4 which um, also includes the two of you. And this is the, um, you can't get rid uh, of the resolution authorizing the creation of a plan for single property community reinvestment areas, and specifically at 150 South, 5600 West. And um, thank you for working with us on this. I appreciate it. Go ahead. Yes, um, we have held small working group meetings with the, the individual board members to bring them up to speed on the process for this project. What you have before you this evening is essentially a request for action from the board to essentially set up and authorize staff to move forward with creating the project area. And again, this would be the single property uh, project area for the purposes of um, entering into a reimbursement agreement with Stadler uh, for their facility out um, on 5600 West and so the next steps for this would be that as staff moves forward we would continue to work through the application process with the developer as they are finalizing the details of their project um, we will also engage a third-party consultant to start looking at the feasibility and the cost-benefit analysis for the project and we will also start drafting uh, what would be the uh, the redevelopment plan for setting up the project area all of those would come back to you as a board to approve, both in terms of the agency uh, doing the interlocal agreement for the project area, as well as the reimbursement agreement with the developer. And so you would have the opportunity to review all of the findings within that cost benefit analysis, as well as the structure for the reimbursement agreement as we finalize those terms. And then you would have the ability also as the city council to approve it in terms of entering into the interlocal agreement for the capture of the property tax for the reimbursement. So this is just the process to authorize us to move forward with gathering that information and start putting the deal together. Okay, discussion. Aaron. I want to thank you for working through this, um, as you've been so willing to do with us in, to, in small groups um, and answering our questions. And thank you. This timeline that we have that uh, people can look at on the fourth or fifth page of the packet there, 
Mm -hmm. um, the dates being included in there, this is a wonderfully transparent process. Thank you. And, and it's, oh, the computer was asking me to discuss. Did you hear that? Sorry, that, um, what an in, what a inventive way for us to be more competitive and secure um, some pretty significant development and investment in our city. So I, I appreciate your creativity in this and um, the advantage that it's going to bring to Salt Lake City as we compete more and more with uh, surrounding municipals on getting anchor projects like this to happen. I feel great about this. Thank Thanks. Charlie or James, anything? Um, so I, I have a um, housekeeping question. So do we need a motion to adopt this resolution? Okay, we didn't have that in the paperwork that I, <laughs> a, a specific motion written. The resolution is there, but it's not. So I would look for. I'll move for adoption of the resolution as written. <clears throat> Okay, motion by Board Member Mendenhall, second by Board Member Luke. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The um, resolution is adopted unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, we now move to item B5. And why it looks like we'll have Laura Fritz and Danny Walls <laughs> here with us, joined by Jill Wil Wilkerson-Smith. And is Allison from our office here, there she is. You're just out of my line of sight, Allison. I was hiding. Thank you so much. And um, Allison, do you do you want to start for us, or should we have Danny start, or Jill? I believe any one of us can start. Um, I would I would say that uh, this is the follow up to the previous round of of uh, discussion on the single property tax increment reimbursement resolution and that uh, it appears that all of the um, from my analysis the uh, it appears that all of the council members concerns sorry board members were taken into account so maybe Danny could take it from there hey thank you very um, much yeah as, as um, discussed this is the follow-up uh, to the comments that we heard when we last presented this item to the board and so in the interest of time I'll run through those real fast and let you know how we've addressed those and then if there's any questions or discussion obviously we'd be happy to have that um, first was a clarification in terms of whether the reimbursement would be for the landowner or the tenant and so we clarified that it would be a priority for the landowner but it could also be uh, for a long-term lease of the property however the agency would have the authority uh, in agreeing whether they wanted to participate at that level or not uh, the second item was a change in the participation rate which there was discussion of the 90% amount being a little bit too high and wanting to come back and change that. So what we did is we had the base rate stay at 70% with the ability to qualify for up to two of the criteria uh, and reach 80%. But then in order to get any further or get up to 90%, that would have to come back to the board and it would either have to demonstrate a substantial cost burden and or a substantial benefit that maybe you wanted to include for the developer so that was how we set it up to where you would not reach any higher than 80 percent without coming back to the board for approval of that third would be the inclusion of providing a public cost analysis for the city in terms of costs that may be imposed to the city and specifically the general fund um, so coming back and, and having that be part of what our third party analysis would be. And then the fourth would be that we added language that as part of the gap analysis and the financial uh, analyst, they would look at making sure that the property value was not being overcompensated to the developer. So that would be one of the factors that they would look at in their analysis. So those are the four items we took from the meeting. That's how we've proposed. That's been addressed within the resolution and the program. And happy to answer any questions on that. Board members, any questions about I think it? the policy question yeah. is a good one. Yeah. And I'd like to discuss Go that. Go with that. Around um, whether or not we should come back to this in a year after it's been operating and review the single property business retention tool. Um, that a date for check-in. Okay. Not to sunset, but... Uh, is that just a review of the, what we've done and an update on the progress? Or? Utilization and give us some numbers. Do you th do you think mm -hmm. that a year's enough time? I think so. 
And, and if not, maybe at that point we would just reach out to the chair and the vice chair of whether we push that out a little bit, but I okay. think we can certainly do that. So can we add this, Madam Chair, to our follow-up item somehow that perhaps in a November 18 meeting? Uh, yeah, let's do that. That we would make a formal request to have a written review of the single property business retention tool and the tax increment reimbursement program policy and see where we are in a year and if it needs some tweaking mm -hmm. then we can and I think that. if I may one of the ideas of the policy question was to focus on recommendations that if right. RDA staff can come back with specific right. recommendations that, for changes to the that policies. Maybe Thank they've you. recognized need yeah. to change yeah okay excellent anything Thanks. further okay then I would look for a motion to adopt the resolution second we have a motion to adopt a resolution involving tax increment reimbursement program policy um, motion by board member Luke second by board member Mendenhall I think I got that right um, all in favor aye any opposed the resolution is adopted unanimously thank you very much we've already talked about item um, six um, are there any announcements from the executive director um, David nothing okay and um, announcements from the staff uh, the only announcement I was going to have is to follow up on your earlier comments regarding the overnighter um, we did convey to the board uh, it was one of those things that I apologize we dropped the ball on and by we I mean me in terms of transferring that appraisal so that has been transmitted so you have that information follow up on that uh, as we've indicated we have closed on the property we have indicated to the manager, obviously, uh, we're not taking any more tenants. As part of the purchase agreement, they have the ability for 11 days to stay within the property and, and move out. We are in conversations with them to extend that for 30 days so that we can have a smooth transition of management of that property and make sure that the, the residents are being taken care of. In that time, we have reached out to the residents and served them the notice that we are legally required to do under HUD guidelines um stating that they are not being kicked out number one and number two that they have the ability and the potential for qualifying for relocation assistance through the agency and we have a meeting scheduled with them next tuesday to convey that information this has been difficult to get the requirements in order because this is a motel property it is not clearly defined within the hud guidelines of how the relocation works and so we have been working through that with someone from hud we likely will engage a consultant to help guide that relocation process to make sure that we are doing everything over and above what the bare minimum requirements are so that we don't jeopardize this project and any future funding for that. Um, we are actively looking to secure the property and the units. We are stepping up security on the property. We are going to be going out um, and doing management of it and securing anything we have to do for an ongoing basis. And the goal is to turn around and market the property right after the first of the year through the RFP process. And um, other than that, we will continue to report to you on the status. How, how many people do we have who were living there? Um, we, we started with um, what we felt was close to 17 to 20 permanent residents. And as of notice of us buying it, I think we're down to 10 or 11 right now. Um, we feel that there's probably seven units that legitimately have been there for a considerable amount of time that we're going to probably have to have significant relocation assistance to. And then the other few units are ones that have been there shorter term, but probably still qualify because it is their primary, primary place of residence. And in the budget amendment, we are funding yes. you to help do that relocation yes, so that budget and, amendment is basically split halfway between right. relocation and management okay and, and that relocation will also include the commercial business which is on the site as well that they okay. qualify as well so we're working with them but uh, very good can I ask a question about that yes I'm sorry did are we partnering with some organization to do placement Yes, we will probably reach out to uh, partner with someone and find out what resources are available. It's something that we're going to need help with. Who's and that so partner? That we don't know yet. Who are the likely partners? Uh, either the housing authority or anyone that the, the relocation consultant can put us in touch with. But we will identify those partners. Okay. And Very good. Councilman yes. Adams, I hope you don't mind if I take a little discretion. Please. I really would love to thank our staff because clearly we were 
not expecting to acquire a motel property. <laughs> um, and so within just a few days, they were able to pull together the closing, get out on site, notify tenants, secure the property. They've worked their tails off to make mm. this project happen. And so I just like to take a moment and thank them for their efforts. And I would like to join you in thanking them because I know it yes. really took a lot in a very short period of time and they did an extraordinary job and we appreciate what hard work they did. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm looking to Cindy and Jennifer's not here. Are, are we good? Oh, there you are. I was looking right there and that's Allison, I'm sure. Um, I, are, are we okay with asking to have an, a short RDA meeting on the 28th then so that we can address um, the, how the questions in housing? as well as other work. We just have so much going on that we figured we needed to do another meeting in there. Jennifer, do you want to? As that, that's the next thing on the report of the chair and vice chair. That's my question. <laughs> really, it's more to allow for a discussion on the other budget amendment that's coming, right, that's coming. or that came uh, relating to the alternative proposal for housing funds. Um, so we're going to discuss the city side of that budget amendment uh, week. next week. And then uh, the RDA side of it, because there's obviously there's two sides. If you're relocating the money from the RDA to the Housing Trust Fund, um, we could discuss that on the 28th. Obviously, they're all, uh, as you guys discussed earlier, they're all maybe interrelated and inter interrelated. And so, well, maybe we'll think of some agenda language to ensure that you can discuss any aspect. Um, but otherwise, you would have to uh, brief the budget amendment on December 5th, hold a hearing on December 5th, and decide on and potentially decide on December 5th. So we're just trying to preserve the uh, deliberation period for you guys. So so. Have a little bit. Okay, so don't we, mean to insert more we meetings. Will, we will plan on that um, for uh, November 28th. Anything? Typi to add, Cindy? Typically, we check with the council chair and vice chair and the body. So you have some of that. Those folks next to you, if they say yes, it'll. Uh, Make are, are you all them. okay with that? The the majority, Charlie, are you good with that? Okay, the, we have we have a majority. There's four. I right? I learned really early in this job that the only number that really mattered in my life was four. Four. And if I could count to four, I could do this job. So so that was good. Then we will talk for a minute um, about written briefings um, and see if there are questions about that. We received a written briefing on the public benefits analysis of the proposed nine line and State Street community reinvestment areas, CRAs, and also the Northwest Quadrant um, update uh, as a community reinvestment area. Any questions on either of those written briefs that you want to address? Aaron, do you have anything? Or James? Charlie? Okay. Then, that being the case, I do believe, unless someone has something else, oh, I, all these other things too, sorry. I turned the page uh, too soon. Um, the additional um, written briefings, nothing on any of the written briefings, okay. Then we will um, adopt the um, consent agenda, which is to set the date for budget amendment number three for fiscal year 2017-18 related to housing funding. We'll set the date of December 5th, uh, 2017 at two o'clock. We'll accept public comment on the resolution regarding that. Do I need a motion so moved. to do that? Okay. Second. Okay, moved by board member Luke, seconded by board member Rogers. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any discussion? I should have said that first. I didn't think there was, sorry. Okay, then that is adopted unanimously and we stand adjourned. Great. And I would look to the um, council vice chair who's yes. chairing our meeting. How long of a break would you um, like to how, have? So how long is it gonna take the recorder to how long do you need to get this, everything switched over? Okay. Just a minute. Okay, so let's come back. Um, five, is five minutes okay? Okay, let's come back in, uh, at 4.20, and please try to be back, and we'll get through the rest of this. So if somebody can let um, transportation know, um, I don't know how long it's gonna take them to get here. If, if they're not ready, we can move forward on, on some of the other stuff, but uh, <laughs> that's where we'll go. See you in five minutes.